Founders Floor, a co-working accelerator for startups. I'm Eva Koo. Um, I'm an investor at Vertex Ventures. We're a early stage um, fund focused exclusively on enterprise or B2B tech. Um, so early stage for us um, means everything from incubation to probably Series B, but we primarily focus on Series A deals. Um, the earlier stage tends to be in areas where we have um, a lot of experience or um, kind of like outsourced um, knowledge of the team itself. Um, and though those areas are historically in infrastructure technology and cybersecurity, um, DevOps tools, um, and increasingly we're looking more at application layer um, and industry 4.0 technologies applied to um, older industries. So I'm Bruce Schechter. I, uh, first, a quick bit about me. I'm an Intel Corporation veteran from way, way back, uh, which was a golden opportunity for me. I, I, I'm finally realizing I'm at this stage of life where I look around a room and I'm older than everybody in the room. But uh, I had the privilege of learning a lot from the, the uh, you know, well-known leaders of Intel, Andy Grove and Gordon Moore, back in the good old days. and. I did, I did a variety of things, engineering and then product marketing for microprocessors and then a stint for four years in their first ever corporate strategy organization. Um, really great prep for what I do now, with, although I had no idea back then that you know, I would evolve into what I do now. So for the last 10 years, I really don't do anything professionally other than work with startups, often in advisory roles on rare occasions as an investor if I get super excited. I'm a member of the Band of Angels. We are a, well, we're, we're classically known as the oldest angel, organized angel investor network in Silicon Valley and arguably probably the world because it was all invented here. Uh, although I'm a recent entry into the thing starting about eight or nine years ago. Um, so we're a, mem we're a member group of 150 uh, members, all of whom, well, the vast majority of whom were actually startup founders, uh, although there's a rare examples of the corporate types like me. We do, obviously, early stage angel investing, uh, preferably the very first money into a company. Uh, we'll typically put together within our group anywhere from, you know, three to 12 people will go together to form a pool of anywhere from 250,000 up to a million dollars in an extreme case. Probably more often than not, it's syndicated with other investors of some kind, either seed stage firms or or other you know angels outside of our own network. Um, so we're we're we call ourselves uh, uh, market market segment agnostic. We don't care where it is, but it's got to be tech. And we have, we have group, subgroups within our group of like life sciences and software and SaaS and, and uh, uh, clean tech and such. Um, so we have a broad variety of interests. I personally tend to align towards things that are not consumer oriented because I don't understand consumers. I like to think about how things are sold into businesses. Uh, so I think I've given more than you asked for. That's good. No, that's good. That's very good. So I have a uh, list of questions here. Please go ahead and log on and go ahead and up or down vote and ask your questions you want. But it just happens to be I pre-populated the system with some questions. And uh, one of the questions we had uh, is at the stop, start, top of the list. So I'm going to start out here. And one of the questions that the crowd would like to know is, um, you know, a lot of the people in the audience are fundraising right now. Um, how much time should founders expect the fundraising process to take from, from start to finish? You know, from start all the way to uh, Money is wired in the bank. So maybe I'll, uh, maybe uh, Bruce, would you mind starting off with that? Sure. Well, every founder that I've ever talked to after the fact drastically underestimated the amount of effort it's going to be. Um, I would say, first of all, it is the job of the CEO. If you think you're going to delegate it, you're very, very likely wrong. And uh, I I'm probably not exaggerating to say that for many months this could be like a half-time job for that CEO. Uh, it, it, I find fundraising to be a highly iterative process. Like nobody gets it right on their first pitches. So just, just you have to obsess that don't worry when you fail 
and you get nasty feedback because you want that. You thrive on feedback. You want it every time. Okay, here's my thing. You go to a meeting with a VC or an angel or whatever, and then when you come home, you don't look at each other and say, man, that guy was an idiot. He just didn't get it. You do not say that. You say, what did we do wrong? Why? How can we do this differently next time? How do we evolve the, evolve the deck? How do we evolve the way we behave, the way we talk, whatever? So that's my advice. Completely echo everything you said. Um, the other thing I would say is because it's an iterative process, um, just know that when you're first meeting uh, an investor, you're basically leaving little breadcrumbs with them. They're going to latch onto any metric or number that you share with them. Um, and then if you resurface a few months later, um, they're going to hold you to those numbers. And so you want to, again, everyone always says you under, you know, over promise, under deliver, but make sure whatever you say in those initial meetings, um, you will feel comfortable repeating to them or having them repeat to you a couple months down the line because that's going to be how they're measuring your effectiveness as an uh, execution team. Next question is from an audience member, Cedar. Cedar, to give you the mic here. Sorry. I'd like you to go ahead and ask it. So, um, my question is really about how do you actually get the pitch decks that you choose? to respond to and take a meeting with somebody. Where did those come from? Are they, you know, cold emailed in or some other source? More often than not, um, the ones that end up going the farthest in our process are ones where we have some kind of relationship with the founder themselves or they've managed to introduce themselves through, um, through another mutual introduction. Um, that feels, again, this is a relationship game and um, these relationships that investors and, and entrepreneurs have last many, many years. Um, and so having some kind of trusted foundation um, is helpful and a mutual introduction can be, you know, can provide that. Um, have I taken an, an email off a cold LinkedIn message? Yes, absolutely. But that happens when I feel like they've truly, un like it's not completely random, but they have actually, they know who I am, they know who my firm is, and it's a catered, um, it's a catered message. Yeah, I have a hard time adding anything to what Eva said. Um, I want somebody to come to me through somebody I know and trust. And it's not just any old person that you find we're connected via on LinkedIn, because unfortunately, two thirds of the people I'm connected to on LinkedIn, I, I made the mistake of you know connecting with somebody. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And and founders that are good at fundraising on average are really good at building their network, and you can't begin too early to build your network because when you get out there and start fundraising. All that building of your network is going to pay off because you up, you're upping the odds that you're going to be able to know somebody in common with some investor that you're going to target. Next question is from Wes Walker. Wes, yeah. it's okay. Maybe he doesn't want to ask the question, so I'm going to go and ask it for him. Oh, Wes, yes. Okay, I'm going to pass the mic to you here. Somehow, I like Donna here. Hi, I'm Wes. Hi, everyone. What are your thoughts on safes for fundraising? <laughs> um, it's basically, a, a safe is basically a convertible note that's become very popular with Y Combinator and companies that go through Y Combinator. Um, and so as a result, they are seen as almost the de facto standard for a lot of companies raising seed capital um, because Y Combinator has made it the de facto for them. Um, so I would say that no investor will blink an eye if you provide a safe note as the first form of money into a company. Um, yeah, that's about it. I guess I'm, I'm a little leery about having a strong opinion because I'm not an expert on T's and C's and of, of uh, you know, investment vehicles, but I will say I know a lot of my colleagues at the Band of Angels are, we're, we're kind of old fashioned. We're pretty leery about this because we want to know what we're really buying, and and it and a safe. It, the good news is it's really easy to do, and it's quick, and it's cheap for you because you won't pay your lawyer a lot. The bad news is it doesn't lock down very well what our rights are going to be in the long term, and arguably either yours. So I, it's a really tough call. I mean, my only advice is get a great lawyer like this, 
and just grill them and make them, you've got to understand this stuff better, way better than I do, because you have a lot more at stake. Yeah, the, the one thing, the other thing I'll note, I'll add on to that is, um, these, um, these saves, they convert into equity upon the pricing of the next round, um, and so, um, investors like it because it's very easy, entrepreneurs like it because it's easy, but unless you are confident that you know um, what the value of your company is going to be at that next round, there's a chance that you can come, become extremely diluted and lose a lot of your company. Um, next question is from Maya. Maya, there's a good question here I want you to ask if you'd like. Yeah. Go ahead and introduce yourself too. Hi, I'm Maya Sardin. Um, so my question is about equity crowdfunding, um, since that has been sort of the new thing that I've been hearing. What are your thoughts from an investor perspective, like pros and cons on that kind of a platform? All I know is I have nothing to do with it. I would, wouldn't touch it, but I, I don't mean to be facetious and I have, maybe there are, maybe there's great deals out there, but no knowledge. Um. So it, it really depends on how much you actually value the, um, the help of an investor. Um, an investor really is there to be an advocate, not only to help you grow your company, but also to help provide introductions and grow your network so that for future fundraisers, you have someone to be in your corner. When you're doing a crowdfunding campaign, those are all name, nameless faces. No one's going to help you. It's money, so from that perspective, there, there, you know, there's value in that, um, but there's no value beyond that. One thing I'll ask as a follow-up to that, which is, and maybe uh, even you might be able to shed some light on this, is that when you see a deal that you guys like, it's just that the cap table is huge because they did some sort of crowdfunding prior. Uh, sometimes, do you see that as like a mess you just have to clean up, or what's your feeling when you see this huge cap table like that? <laughs> um, it gets confusing when you when. Uh, you know, when an investor comes on, they have rights and, you know, there's there's voting rights. And when there's a really messy cap table, that complicates the ability to pass through decisions because you're, like, chasing down, you know, people left, right, and center. Um, so is it a deal breaker? No. Does it add a lot of complications and unnecessary headache? Absolutely. We don't see crowdfunding campaigns necessarily, but we do see a lot of um, very large friends and family rounds where there's a lot of individuals on a cap table. Probably some convertible notes as well. You don't know, some of them have different types of caps and stuff and you, they're gonna go and you know change and, uh, and convert in weird ways. And so it's just a mess sometimes you have to clean up. So um, next question is actually one that we, we asked here, which was um, what are some of the key characteristics that make for uh, a good entrepreneur to be successful. You guys have probably seen thousands of entrepreneurs and throughout the, your career. What are some of those characteristics you like to see? Um, obviously, you have to have a high EQ, IQ to, to build something, you know, tech-wise, which is an area that we focus on. But I think having a high EQ is probably one of the most, um, it's, it, it's an extremely um, sought-after characteristic, um, primarily because as the builder of the company, you're also going to be the person who's like advocating the vision of the company and which needs to like be, you know, would, and you need to build, build a team around you. So you might have a great idea, but if, unless you have the ability to actually build a team to be able to like represent your company in front of, you know, uh, potential buyers for, you know, because you're initially the salesperson when you start a company, um, we have to have the faith, the faith that you have the EQ and the ability to do all of those thing, so I would say that. Yeah, I, I agree with, with all of that. I would say um, a couple of thoughts come to mind. I, first on my mind is grit, you know, just utter, utter dedication to do what it's going to take. And, and I mean, examples would be, I actually tend to be leery when somebody comes from a bigger company because they have this kind of mindset of, well, I'm used to having all these casts of thousands to solve problems, and now all of a sudden there are no casts of thousands. It's you and the dog. And, you know. So, but um, second, I, I love the EQ comment. I, I would probably expand on that as just the CEO and the CEO communication skills are everything. Oh, oh, I'll, I, I, here's the way I'd put it. Uh, I, uh, I, I heard a uh, gentleman at one of the big VC firms say at one point that. 
trying to, trying to think how he said it, but he said, one of our final criteria before we write the check is we bring in the founding team and we spend a lot of time with them going through all the plans and whatever. And one of the key things we're looking at is, is any of the key founders who's gonna be working with us, are they, I forget his term, but it was something like complicators. Do they tend to go into deep explanation and start to use terms that nobody understands or whatever in there? So the guy, this gentleman's point was, we got very little time to deal with this company. Everything's gotta be oversimplified and dead clear. You know, I mean, it's just got to, we got to be able to talk to them in short amount of time, get the big picture, and move on. And so, you know, your CEO and, and the people around him, you've got to just practice, explain, everybody in this world who will listen to you describing what is your company, what is your strategy, how do you how acquire customers. You tell that story in very simple terms and do it over and over until it just flows mind-bogglingly clear out of your mouth. And the uh, final question I have, and then we're going to actually get started with the pitch event, which is um, companies that are you know, pitching tonight are obviously fundraising, but there's going to be another. The other is going to be uh, fundraising pretty soon. What are some um, things that. That'd be us for you. I think it might be this one. Let me go. Right. Yeah. 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 These get dropped a lot, and so I think that one's a goner right there. But what are some of the final thoughts on advice that founders, you know, who are pitching tonight and, and in other events, what do they need to have in that deck to be able to get that next meeting? You know, what are the, some key things that they need to have that's, you know, in this five minutes, which is a short amount of time, that they need, you, need, you need to be able to have in your head to say, yes, let's, let's have a sit down uh, next week. So I'm going to keep the mic here. <laughs> well, for, for any of you who already know what I'm going to say, great, but for most of you, overwhelmingly often entrepreneurs want to spend way too much time talking about their product itself. And for me, that's like 10% of the story. You know, like, I, I'm usually, it's not that hard for me to get what's, what is your product, and what's special about it. Although you gotta do a good job of that, I don't take it away. But in addition, to, and I'm probably exaggerating when I say 10%, maybe, okay, maybe it's 35%, but absolutely no more than that. The key things I wanna know are, do you know how to build a business around that product? So uh, in particular, I wanna know about your team. I wanna be, you know, we need to believe these are not just good people. These are phenomenal people. These are exceptional people, because if they're not, there's plenty of them out there, you know? Um, so that's number one. And number two uh, is my ultimate favorite, it's go-to-market strategy. You know, I, I would say, you know, more often than not, when dollars are spent investing in a company, and then eventually those dollars are lost, the reason in one way or another relates to they couldn't acquire paying customers fast enough to be able to, you know, have a finance, you know, a, a sound financial plan. Even in spite of investor dollars coming in, those those are not enough. So you've got to really obsess around go-to-market strategy. You know, it's just I think you've got to answer the question: How will we acquire customers? And it'll evolve. You don't have to be perfect on the first try, but boy, you better be able to tell me. And anybody who talked to me here tonight already knows this. That's what I'm going to ask you. <laughs> Um, I'd probably add that, you know, it's this kind of funnel approach where you have to have a, be solving a problem that's big enough for people to care about in a market that is big enough for people to care about. Um, and then being able to actually have a solution or, tech, or technology that actually is defensible to solve that problem um, and that you actually know who you're selling into. And this, a lot of this goes to the go-to-market piece. Um, but really understanding your buyer and how they're going to purchase and consume your product um, and then the team because we need to be able to believe that you're, you know, the team to be able to execute on it.